Before I start my talk, I just wanted to read um, something from an ad campaign in 1997, an ad campaign that I love very much. Here is to the crazy ones, the, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in square holes, the ones who see things differently. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who actually do. I'm very happy to be here, um, to be able to share my thoughts with you, like um, other TED speakers. Um, one of my favorite TED talks um, was of Komla Dumont, and Bolloré and I didn't plan this together, um, but um, it was of his TED talk in Houston, London. And he talked of the need for us as Africans to write our own narratives. Um, from his perspective, if we didn't write our own stories, um, someone else would. And you bet it will be from their perspective of how Africa is. Um, and it's very possible that it will be biased towards their worldview of Africa. For many young Ghanaians, and I'm sure many Africans like myself, Komla Dumont represented the the new African dream, um, the belief that with dint of hard work and creativity, uh, it's possible. I remember the first time when I heard that um, I'd gone to Harvard, and I sent him a little note um, that just read, Chale Komna, Harvard, next level, or next level. He sent a little note back, and that just says, ha, 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 ha. You know how Komna and then, after Harvard, I found out that it was going to BBC. And I sent him another message. I was like, Komna, BBC, this one, yeah, you've killed me. And then he sent a message, and it was, ha, 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 RIP from the BBC. Like, that's just so amazing. I, I was just so gobsmacked with what he'd been able to do with himself from joy to the BBC. And uh, for many of us, uh, for many of us Africans um, growing up, he's left an indelible mark um, that, that is not going to go away for a very long time. Um, and so RIP, Komla Dumont. Technology has changed the world that we live in. Technology is perhaps the greatest diffuser of information and great ideas in the world today. I mean, this book here would have been confined only to this space if it wasn't for technology like the cameras you see there or the internet. Technology has changed the world. Technology has shrunk the world. Technology has boosted human productivity. Um, technology has promoted economic development. Technology has saved billions of lives. But I bet, like most people, when we talk about technology saving billions of lives, the first thing that comes to our mind is of robotic medical equipment um, that is used in hospitals to perform um, complex surgeries or equipment used in laboratories to um, produce and test the efficacy of drugs. The last thing that we think of are gadgets like TVs, gadgets like radios, like mobile phones. The last thing we think of in terms of saving billions of lives are those gadgets. And the reason is simple. With these gadgets, the first thing that comes to our mind is entertainment. So with mobile phones, you like taking selfies and sending it on WhatsApp. You like to watch your favorite TV shows on TV and listen to your favorite radio shows on the radio. But it can be more than this. Those gadgets can entertain us and educate us at the same time. This idea is called entertainment education. And that's here, what I'm here to talk to you about. How many of you remember this tune? Da, na, 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 and entertainment education, entertainment education, the nomenclature is quite vast. Um, some call it infotainment, edutainment, 
and to educate. It goes on and on. But irrespective of the descriptor that is used, its objectives are the same, to promote understanding, improve knowledge, and promote behavior change through TV soaps, serials, films, etc. And it's worked brilliantly in India. Um, in India, it's um, reduced HIV prevalence rates, um, reduced HIV acquisition rates, promoted literacy, promoted better sanitation, um, reduced domestic violence. It's done wonders. So why isn't it being used more in this part of the world? In a part of the world where, where people are speakers and listeners more than readers and writers, and the part of the world that, given our tradition of um, oral talking and our tradition, our tradition of um, spoken word and folk theater, why isn't it being used more here? Before I answer that question, I'll just give you a little, I'll just tell you a little story. That's me as a, I think, two or three year old. And I grew up in what was usually called the crazy 80s. As you can see from my outfit, it's pretty crazy, right? Um, it looks like a girl's dress, but my mom said it was unisex. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we could have the color to probably see that it's pink with dots in it or something. So I grew up in what is usually termed as the crazy 80s. Um, in school, my teachers thought I was crazy. I was very good at art. I loved drawing cartoons on my shirt. I'll draw cartoons in class. I'll get lashed when I got home, obviously. I'll draw cartoons on the school walls, everywhere I could. Even for math formulas, I'll try and draw cartoons in them. And so I'm pretty good at art. I won lots of art prizes. And initially, it was pretty cool to win art prizes. But then along the way, I started realizing that much value wasn't placed on the art prizes. Um, the subjects that really seemed to matter were science and maths. But I sucked at science. Um, I was the type of kid who got a C- minus for science, and then in brackets, the teacher would put A for effort, which showed how useless I was. <sighs> the worst times for me was speech day. Um, and you could just see the looks on the face of parents when they mentioned the winners of the science prize. And the winners were usually my older sisters, which made the matters much worse. Um, and you see the parents clapping furiously and stamping their feet and whistling. And when they mentioned the winners of the art prize, the clubs were tepid, there was silence, no one seemed to care. And what made matters worse was my mom. After she would come and, come and give me what she thought was a, 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 pep, a pep talk, and she would come and she'd like, JK, why the long face? Huh? An art prize is a prize, even if it's not an important prize like science or maths prize. Hmm? Don't ever let anyone make it superior. I was like, gee, thanks, mom. <laughs> the reason why I bring up this story is simple. At such a young age, I'd already realized the, the low valuation that society and the microcosm of the school environment um, placed on education. And that is the problem here in Africa. A lot of our behavior experts, um, who are usually medics or scientists, don't see it as being important enough. Anything that falls under the stream or the umbrella of, of art is not empirical enough, not scientific enough. And that's a mistake. Um, because as I'll show you later on, um, interventions like entertainment education are underpinned by very strong science. Most people in Ghana and probably across Africa know me as the character junior in Home Sweet Home, which was many years ago. Yeah. I was much more masculine then, and, and I'm married now, so my wife has been feeding me a lot, so. Um, Home Sweet Home was modeled on the Cosby show, and the reason was simple. Like Komla said, we wanted to tell our own story of Africa. We wanted to give a balanced view, and um, something was a bit more accurate of Africa, that there were affluent families in Africa, um, and it was very risky initially to start off with um, because as one of the actors and writers of uh, Home Sweet Home and I was a producer as well in episodes, um, I started practicing entertainment education through Home Sweet Home. So episodes dealt with HIV, domestic violence, and what have you. Um, but it was quite risky then because getting actors to actually act those roles were difficult. 
actors didn't want to be typecast because they were scared that if one day they were ill and they went to the clinic, someone would say they've actually got HIV. So being able to deal with these taboo topics was quite difficult. But I always had this sense of accomplishment when I went out and I met people who came up to me and were like, hey, thanks for that episode. And they'll quote lines from the episode and like, you really changed how I thought about this or it actually promoted positive behavior in this way and that way. It was really good. I just felt a real sense of accomplishment. Um, graduate studies at Oxford um, helped me to short circuit this practical experience I had from home sweet home with theoretical principles, principles that I'll talk about in a second. But um, after grad school, I actually wrote a couple of home sweet home episodes, and then I conducted a randomized control trial to evaluate its effectiveness. For you who know about experimental design, our CTs are right at the top. Um, they are right at the top because of the randomization nature of the experiment, as well as the use of control groups. Um, it increases validity and minimizes bias. Um, so I conducted an RCT in a village in Ghana and exposed the, um, the audience to um, TV shows. The results were compelling. Um, pre and post results, um, interviews, show that knowledge had increased by about 83%. Um, Follow-up data six months, one year, and two years later, um, increase in knowledge had actually translated into behavior change. The results were very compelling. So why is entertainment education or drama, theme drama, why is it so effective? Now, it's underpinned by two um, scientific theories. The first one is drama theory. And this is how it works. Drama theory states that you actually get emotionally involved in a film or a TV show because whilst you're watching it, your feelings are oscillating between two plausible outcomes. Your hope of what might happen and your fear of what could happen. And this excitement and this tension is actually what makes you enjoy the film or the TV show. Similarly, Social cognitive theory underpins entertainment education. And this states that we actually learn behavior by watching others. So when you're watching a TV show, the actor becomes a role model who later you model your behavior on. How many of you here watch 24? Okay. So did you know, this is a bit of trivia for you, that's the fake president and the real president. Did you know that 24 apparently contributed to Obama winning the presidency in the States. It's actually hard research that shows that that did happen. Because what happened, and this is very much social cognitive theory, the idea of a black president, a good black president, in this case a black president supported by the Senate, actually made white America sensitized to the idea of a black president. That shows how powerful messages in TV shows and films can be. It can win elections, and it can save billions and billions of life. The African media and, ent and entertainment industry has been growing at a steady rate of about 5% GDP per capita over the past couple of years. And this trend will continue for the next three to five years. Knowledge, as you can see there, is one of the biggest players in terms of movies produced within this industry. Nollywood produces about a thousand films per year. About 20 million VCDs per month are sold across West Africa alone. In West Africa alone. So that doesn't include the internet, um, TV shows, and piracy as well is not factored into this. So Multiply that by four people per, per household, which is a conservative number, and you have about 80 million people viewing Nolulu films in West Africa alone in a month. So what if the trillions of dollars that have been, been invested in aid in behavior change strategies, what if part of that was actually invested 
Nollywood films. I mean, the infrastructure is already there. People already have TV sets, they already have mobile phones, they already have radios. You don't have to invest in any new stuff. What if that money was actually invested in Nollywood films that had hidden messages? Can you imagine the effect on diseases like Ebola, on cholera, if we had hidden messages in these TV shows? And that's why I read the, the few lines that I did in the beginning. Those lines were from Apple's campaign in 1997. And it's about thinking different. You see, Apple is a brand that thinks differently. It's been able to short circuit art with science, art with engineering. And that's why I want to leave you here today, that we actually have to start thinking differently about interventions that work for us. Because I strongly believe that we're sitting on a lottery ticket that we haven't cashed, which is entertainment education. I strongly, strongly believe that. And I strongly believe that entertainment education is the missing piece in the complex jigsaw puzzle that we call behavior change and development. Thank you very much.